Thanks for joining us. So far we have good provincial and extra provincial attendance, so that's great. Okay, well, to avoid continuing awkward silence, why don't we uh, get started? So um, as all of you know, if you have questions there, you can put them into the Q&A box at the bottom toolbar. And at the end of this, if you wanna ask a question verbally, you click on the hand raise and we'll be able to answer it. If you have any problems, please contact Sedoni at the email that you see there. Uh, importantly, this session, as all our sessions are recorded and will be posted on the website. And today on September 9th, this is our first um, session, but I want to acknowledge that we host this session on the unceded and ancestral territory of the Coast Salish peoples. That includes the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh Nations and Métis Charlie community of the Lower Mainland region. And across this Turtle Island, as well as this province, you are in uh, and acknowledge the territory that you're at, as well as the sadness that many of the people are feeling um, because of the recent losses in Saskatchewan um, that really affect many, many communities. Uh, and I think we need to always acknowledge the pain that, that comes along with the territories and the spaces and places that we occupy and learn from them. So thank you, next slide. So these are province-wide rounds. These are a collaboration between BC Reno and the University of British Columbia. Uh, and I'm really delighted to be able to hand over to Dr. John Gill, who's the transplant lead uh, for um, transplant nephrology and he'll introduce our speaker. Over to you, John. Good morning, Adira. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I just wanna reflect on everything that's happened in Saskatchewan in the last month and um, what a glorious day it is here and the freedoms that we enjoy. Um, uh, and just to say that I don't take those for granted. So um, only to acknowledge uh, the pain and suffering that's going on uh, in the Indigenous community at this time. It gives me a great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Justin Gill, who is a clinical assistant professor uh, in the Division of Nephrology. As many of you know, Justin has joined our transplant program now um, and is a fixture actually at St. Paul's Hospital. Um, uh, I'm particularly proud of the fact that, uh, you know, we're building diversity of skill within uh, the transplant section uh, within the division. Um, Justin has, uh, now just about to uh, complete his master's training uh, in bioethics uh, at Columbia University, where he was supervised by David Hoffman, who's a lawyer and bioethicist. Today, he will be discussing a complex topic. Um, and it, I think it for me, it's really important in that uh, this is an important source of organs uh, for us. But more importantly, I think to showcase the skill um, that we are developing internally. So Justin, without any further ado, I'll turn it over to you. Welcome. Great, thanks, John. Just gonna try to share my screen here. Good morning, everybody. Hopefully everybody can see my screen okay. Yeah. Um, Perfect. Good, great. Perfect. Um, so thanks for the kind introduction, John, and thanks for the intro as well, Adira. Um, so I'm going to talk to you all today about the ethics of directed organ donation following medical assistance in dying. This is my master's thesis work. I've just recently completed my master's thesis and handed it in. That's why John says that I'm close to completion because um, I should be finding out within the next month or so whether I pass. And uh, then I'll be getting my degree in October, hopefully. So um, as, as pointed out, my interest within transplant medicine is within uh, ethics and transplantation, specifically around policy development. And so this is a kind of what we were talking about this before everybody came on. This is a bit of a hot button topic within transplant medicine. 
So we'll be going through a little bit around this. I want to acknowledge that um, any conversation around medical assistance and dying, and especially when you include organ donation, can be um, ethically uh, stimulating, is what I call it, because people have diverse views, and so I want to acknowledge that. Um, and so uh, we'll go through it a little bit, and then we'll have a chance for a Q&A at the end, hopefully, if we have enough time there. So I have no disclosures. Um, I do want to acknowledge and thank the uh, Marsha Bell Fund, which is gener generously provided by one of our late transplant patients and assisted me in funding my master's training. So I chose a discussion on the ethics of directed organ donation after MAID from my own personal experience, actually. So this came up where an individual was uh, undergoing MAID and wanted to directly donate a kidney to a friend's husband. There was a level of discomfort that I witnessed amongst various members of the transplant team and a lack of a formal policy around this. And so it pushed me to think more about the topic. And I thought the ethical considerations were really worth discussing, which is why I focused my master's thesis on this work. So the objectives for today are to describe the current landscape of medical assistance in dying in Canada, discuss the current policies around organ donation following medical assistance in dying in Canada, discuss the current practices of Canadian and international transplant programs with respect to directed organ donation after MAID. And finally, I will present recommendations for organ procurement organizations to help, fulfill, uh, to help facilitate directed organ donation following MAID. So as, as many of you know, um, deceased organ donation is common practice in Canada and provides morbidity and mortality benefits to transplant patients. Deceased organ donation is permitted after either whole brain death or cardiopulmonary determination of death in Canada, otherwise known as NDD and BCD, respectively. There were over 2,800 solid organ transplants completed in Canada in 2021, 78% of which came from deceased donors. And of these 2,800, 1,673 of these were kidney transplants. Despite this, there's a critical shortage of organs for transplantation. Over 4,000 Canadians uh, remained on the transplant wait list at the end of 2021. And in BC, there are currently 448 patients on the deceased donor transplant wait list as of August 2nd, 2022. Um, and in 2021, 6% of Canadians that were awaiting organ transplantation died on the wait list. Specifically for kidney patients, it was approximately 3% of patients that died on the wait list uh, across all of Canada. So various strategies have been attempted to increase the supply of available organs for transplantation. These strategies have included the use of non-directed donors, the use of hepatitis B positive organs, the use of kidney paired donation programs, the uh, removal of disincentives to living kidney donation. And you've heard about some of these um, endeavors through various other forums and previous province-wide rounds, but clearly ongoing innovation is needed to meet the growing demand for organ transplantation. So what I'm going to argue is that wider acceptance of post-made organ donation will increase the number of organ transplants per year. And I want to stress how important post-made donation can be for our organ transplant community and for our wait list. So let's begin by just talking a little bit about the history of medical assistance in dying in Canada and how we got to where we are today. So as a reminder, prior to 2015, MAID was illegal under Section 241B of the Canadian Criminal Code and that anyone who aided or abetted a person committing suicide committed an indictable offense with section 14 of the criminal code establishing that nobody may consent to death being inflicted upon themselves. Now this was challenged in the case that many people know well. Um, it was the 1993 case of Rodriguez v. British Columbia in which the Supreme Court of Canada denied the right to assisted suicide for patient Sue Rodriguez who suffered from ALS. However, um, in 2015, uh, there was a landmark Supreme Court of Case Canada uh, Supreme Court of Canada case called um, Carter v. Canada, in which the prohibition of assisted suicide was challenged and ultimately struck down as a violation of the right to life, liberty, and security of the person in Section Seven of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. In 2016, Bill C-14 was passed and allowed for MAID. And this specified that an individual would have to have a reasonably foreseeable death to qualify for MAID. But this definition of what kind of reasonably foreseeable death was, was, was subject to significant scrutiny and was quite actually overall unclear. So in 2019, as a result of that, um, Truchon v. Canada saw a plaintiff, Truchon, who had cerebral palsy, and then also another plaintiff uh, named uh, Gladue, who had post-polio syndrome. They argued that the federal requirement for a reasonably foreseeable death was far too restrictive and violated the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms as well. So this was ultimately successful in the Superior Court of Quebec, and Bill C-7 was then introduced into the House of Commons in 2020. And it was ultimately passed in 2021. 
So this is where we are today. So Bill C-7 amended the eligibility criteria for MAID by removing the reasonably foreseeable death criterion, and it required that there only be one witness for the MAID request form completion. This bill also established procedural safeguards for people whose death was not reasonably foreseeable by requiring a 90-day assessment period for, uh, for, uh, for full exploration of options to relieve suffering like palliative care, for example. For people whose death is reasonably foreseeable, the bill waived the reflection period and made possible a waiver of final consent at the time of made provision. So for example, if there was concern that a patient would lose capacity by the time that they were gonna undergo made, they could waive their final consent if their death was reasonably foreseeable, meaning likely to happen in the coming weeks to months. So our current eligibility requirements in Canada for medical assistance in dying are that an individual has to be at least 18 years of age. They have to have capacity to make healthcare decisions. They have to be eligible for publicly funded services, and this is to prevent uh, tourism to receive MAID within Canada, and so they have to be eligible for MSP. It has to be a voluntary request uh, without any external pressure. If they have, the patient has to provide informed consent themselves, for the first person informed consent to receive MAID. And they have to be suffering from a grievous and irremediable medical condition. And this is defined within MAID legislation as a serious and incurable illness, disease, or disability. And the patient has to be, in an, as a result of that, in an advanced state of irreversible decline in their capabilities. And they're enduring physical or psychological suffering caused by either of the above. And this is physical or psychological suffering is intolerable to the person and it cannot be relieved under conditions that they think uh, are acceptable. So, of note, mental illness diagnoses will be eligible under MAID in March 2023. Um, there is a report of an expert panel on MAID and mental illness recommendations that was published in May of this year, and that's available online through the Government of Canada website if you're interested. I'm sure this will be a pretty contentious addition to the current MAID legislation, so I encourage you to take a look at that um, in your free time if, if you have any. So what's the MAID request process in Canada? So. Initially, uh, a patient has to fill out a request for MAID form. And again, <clears throat> this is done with a single witness now instead of two witnesses as it used to be. They're then, uh, the patient then undergoes the first assessment by a physician or a nurse practitioner who's trained in MAID assessment. If they're deemed eligible from that assessment, they undergo a second assessment, again, by a physician or a nurse practitioner uh, who's appropriately trained. And then if they're deemed eligible from the two assessments, they undergo provision. Now, if there's a concern, uh, for example, if a second assessor finds that a person is not eligible, it can move to a third assessor. And that time, it has to move to a capacity assessment if there's concerns regarding a patient being able to have the capacity to make these decisions, and ultimately from there can still move to provision. So it doesn't necessarily, there's not necessarily a full stop if one person does not think the individual is eligible. So there is, um, as I mentioned, if there is a reasonably foreseeable death, meaning that the patient may die within weeks to months, there's no requirement for a 90-day reflection period. There was previously a 10-day reflection period that's now been removed. So there's, uh, so these patients essentially don't have to wait for, for provision if their life is going to be ending in short course. If the patient does not have a reasonably foreseeable death, then there's a required 90-day reflection period. In, uh, unless they, the loss of their capacity or capability become imminent, in which case the patient is then switched to kind of a reasonably foreseeable death criterion, in which case they don't have to wait again. So every year the Government of Canada publishes an annual MAID report that I encourage you to take a look at. Um, on the right side of the slide is a visual of the 2021 report that was published earlier this year. So in terms of statistics in 2021, there's an increase in total number of made provisions across the country with a total of 10,064 made provisions representing 3.3% of total Canadian deaths. So as you can see in the graph there, the causes of made provision in 2021 were primarily from cancer representing 65.6% of made provisions, followed, followed next by cardiovascular conditions with rep representing 18.7% and then chronic respiratory conditions at 12.4% and neurological conditions at 12.4%. Now, the most commonly cited reasons for suffering in these patients were a loss of ability to engage in meaningful activities, a loss of ability to perform their own activities of daily living, inadequate control of their pain, and loss of dignity. So again, I encourage anybody who's interested in MAID to review the report from the Government of Canada. It, what struck me is that MAID has gained really significant tra traction over the last several years with more and more patients undergoing MAID for various reasons. 
So what does medical assistance in dying look like in other parts of the world, just for comparators? Um, so in the United States, um, there are 10 states practice MAID. Oregon was the first state to allow MAID in 1997. And what is now consistent across all states that allow MAID is the requirement for a prognosis of six months or less. And the patient must be able to self-administer the um, drug, the lethal drug orally. It is still illegal to offer a lethal injection by a practitioner in the USA. So patients will have to be able to take these medications by mouth. These are the other um, countries that practice made internationally, and we'll go through some of them. Um, Belgium and the Netherlands come up quite a bit later in this talk. Um, but just to note, there are other places around the world that also practice uh, medical assistance in dying. And it goes by different names. Most commonly, it goes by um, euthanasia in a lot of the European countries, for example. So given the ethical debates that surround MAID, understandably, the introduction of discussions around organ donation after MAID have been undertaken with pretty extreme caution, I would say. Um, it was thought initially that the ability to donate organs after MAID would be pretty uncommon because the medical conditions for which people were seeking MAID in the beginning were often things like metastatic cancer, which is a contraindication to organ donation. So as the inclusion criteria continue to expand, so does the idea of post-MAID organ donation. So the first case was documented in Belgium in 2005. The Dutch government was the first to display public support for post-made organ donation in 2014. And this was due to a highly publicized case of a patient who wanted to donate his organs following MAID for a neurological condition and his request was ultimately refused, so he went to the media. So the Dutch government responded by publicly acknowledging and allowing MAID, uh, sorry, post-made organ donation. The first case in Canada was in 2016. It's not possible to donate organs post made in the United States, Luxembourg, and Switzerland. The other countries practicing MAID that we just um, mentioned on the previous slide do not have any public policies that are um, that are at, at, at least transparent regarding post made organ donation. So I'm not sure about the other ones. And then an international roundtable was held in 2021 in the Netherlands with representatives from eight countries where MAID is legal. And it was found that Canada is the leading country with a total of 97 patients who've been able to donate organs following MAID from 2016 to 2020. Now, the vast majority of these patients were from BC, Ontario, and Quebec. And this compares with the total of 74 patients from the Netherlands from 2012 to 2020, and 56 patients in Belgium from 2005 to 2020. So post-MAID organ donation is publicly endorsed by, the, by Canadian Blood Services and locally by BC Transplants as well. So this is a schematic from um, a publication from the CMAJ in, in 2019. And this is an example of clinical pathway for conscious competent patients to be able to donate their organs post-made in Canada. So this was first developed by um, Canadian Blood Services in partnership with the Canadian Critical Care Society, the Canadian Society of Transplantation, and the Canadian Association of Critical Care Nurses. As mentioned, it was uh, published in 2019 as a guideline document for Canadian provincial organizations to help facilitate post-made organ donation. So we're gonna go through it in some detail and speak about the specifics of this now. So steps one and two really involve the decision to undergo medical assistance in dying, which is what we've already been talking about. <clears throat> so consideration, you have to make due considerations for end-of-life care, including palliative care. Um, and then the patient undergoes their first and second assessments for made and ultimately is approved. Please note that the 10-day reflection period in the um, pink part highlighted down here in the in the schematic is no longer required as we previously discussed. So this is a bit out of date being from 2019. So step three is really um, where a patient is informed about the option of organ donation. Now this is likely one of the most contentious issues in post-made organ donation is how to share information about with the patient about organ donation. So there's ongoing debate about whether patients should bring up organ donation voluntarily without provocation uh, before being approached by an organ procurement organization, or if the option can be brought up to the patient by the MAID team. There's concerns that maybe bringing up organ donation during a MAID review could place external pressure on the person in a, in a period of vulnerability. There's concerns around entanglement of MAID and organ donation, which could have repercussions for public opinion of organ transplantation. Specifically, we want to avoid the idea that the organ transplant community is taking advantage of vulnerable MAID patients, as has been described in some opinion pieces on the idea of post-MAID organ donation. And so the question now becomes, how do we inform MAID recipients about organ donation? Do we inform them about the option of more organ donation at all? Do we let this be patient-driven? Do they have to bring it up? Or should there be a standardized method of information dissemination? <clears throat> 
So in 2016, there was a survey by Canadian Blood Services of the general population, and uh, it showed that 80% of respondents believe that organ donation should be discussed with all patients, regardless of their illness um, or end of life decision making. And 53%, um, only 53% agreed that donation should be discussed only after there's been a decision to pursue made. So this shows that the general public perhaps doesn't think that the strict delineation between organ donation and, and made is as important as we think it is. But this obviously requires further study um, because it's a single survey study. In Belgium and the Netherlands, just to give an international uh, perspective, post-made organ donation is discussed openly only if the patient is already registered as an organ donor. If they're not registered, it's up to the MD's discretion who's doing the made assessment whether or not to discuss organ donation with those patients. There are brochures that are included as part of their made package for indirect education regarding um, uh, organ donation, but there's nothing standardized by any means. So in Canada, um, this is not yet a standardized process across pro uh, provinces. We don't have a standardized way to approach patients about organ donation when they come forward for MAID. So some systems respond only to patient-initiated requests, whereas others have post-MAID organ donation built into their discussion around what to expect in the MAID process. So in British Columbia, under the Human Tissue Gift Act of British Columbia that was established in 1996, any impending death occurring in a BC hospital is required to be reported to the organ donor referral line. Now, however, this legislation doesn't really specifically cover MAID, um, since most MAID provisions occur outside of a hospital. So BC Transplant does encourage MAID programs to be consistent regardless with the Human Tissue Gift Act, and if a person is potentially eligible for organ donation, to refer them on if they're interested in uh, speaking to an organ donor specialist. So BC MAID assessors are actually trained to discuss organ donation with patients, and if they're interested, submit a referral to BC Transplant. In my discussions with the MAID teams at BGH and St. Paul's over the last several months, assessors routinely do ask around this, some more consistently than others, depending on their um, comfort level with the idea of organ donation following MAID, but it is fairly standardized. Now, this practice is appropriate to standardize it. I don't think that it places extra, extra pressure on patients undergoing MAID, and it does allow the medical community to respect their autonomous decision to be an organ donor when, you know, in the end, medical assistance in dying is really a, the ultimate respect for a patient's autonomy. <clears throat> so this is directly lifted from a publicly available um, organ donation post-made toolkit on BC Transplant's website. This gives, a, this gives a made assessor examples of language that they could use around presenting the idea of organ donation. Much like the discussion happens around other end-of-life care options like palliative care and symptom management, discussion should be normalized around organ donation. So an example statement would be something like um, the first one here, have you ever considered organ donation as part of your end-of-life care plan? I can have someone from BC Transplant provide you with more information if you'd like to explore this further. So there's various ways in which they say that. A lot of the um, MAID assessors that I spoke to said that they do use this guide in um, helping kind of vocalize um, uh, the idea of organ donation following MAID. Um, so I do think it's quite helpful. So this is the, the second MAID assessor form. Um, and in section eight at the bottom, they're highlighted in red. You can see there's a reminder for MAID assessors to discuss organ donation. Specifically, it reads, your patient may be eligible to be an organ and tissue donor. If your patient is interested in exploring organ donation with BC transplant, please complete the BC transplant referral intake form. So what's important to note is that it's not a requirement or a tick box. It's just simply a reminder to MAID assessors to discuss this with their patients. There's no specific accountability for not referring patients for organ donation. Um, and I think that's important. I don't think we want to make this a punitive process by any means. I think we want to uh, have ongoing close communication between the MAID teams and the organ um, procurement organizations. So now we're turning back to our Canadian guidelines document for post-MAID organ donation. So step four um, involves information sharing from the organ procurement organization if the MAID recipient is eligible for donation. The individual then consents to organ donation and begins an evaluation. So donor testing and evaluation entail questionnaires, interviews, uh, investigations, including blood work and imaging, physical examinations, et cetera. So as much as possible, um, BC Transplant and other organ procurement organizations try to minimize the number of needle pokes and the number of visits to healthcare settings to avoid worsening a person's quality of life at the end of their life, of course. Um, there are options for home visits for blood draws uh, to, again, ensure minimal disruption for patients as well. 
So there are some, so in terms of eligibility to donate organs, so we've talked a little bit about this already, but there are some specific considerations for medical conditions for which people seek MAID, for example. So their eligibility is determined on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, their investigations, including their blood work and imaging, are completed as part of the donor workup to help determine the eligibility for various organ groups. And so just some specific considerations. Um, for metastatic cancer, unfortunately, this is an absolute contraindication to organ donation. But for ALS and other neurodegenerative disorders, um, they are suitable candidates for organ donation, but there are considerations. And that um, the consideration is that some of these neurodegenerative disorders could theoretically be caused by prion diseases. Um, there's also a theoretical risk of non-infectious transmission of intracellular protein aggregates, and some conditions are thought to be transmitted between people like familial amyloid polyneuropathy. So there's no strong, there's no evidence to confirm transmissibility. And many diseases require a very significant length of time to actually show up um, if they're ever going to show up in a potential recipient. So often these cases just require an exceptional distribution consent from recipients about these, I would say, call them theoretical risks um, more than anything. But what I want to get across is that by and far, most of the, of the patients, the non-cancer patients that are undergoing made may potentially be eligible for organ donation, which could uh, significantly increase our, our um, organ transplant numbers. So um, if, the organs, uh, if the patient's organs are accepted for post-made donation, the provision of made must occur in a hospital setting, as they have to be in close proximity to an operating room. So the key here is that the patient must maintain decisional capacity to undergo MAID unless they've had a waiver of final consent uh, completed, as we discussed earlier. <clears throat> so a patient must remain, must retain their capacity as well to donate their organs at the end of life. So let's say if a patient has provided a waiver of final consent, there's no actual clear guidance on what to do about procurement of, of organs after a waiver of final consent. So a patient has waived their final consent to MAID, but there's no specific waiving of final consent to organ donation, as technically they should have the opportunity to withdraw their consent for organ donation at any time up until their death. So this has not been consistently evaluated at the policy level and obviously needs to be looked at in more detail and is something that could come up in the future, of course. <clears throat> so in terms of provision of made and post-made organ donation for organ donors in Canada, as discussed, made must occur in a hospital setting to facilitate the procurement. We call, um, you know, I mean, dying in a hospital setting um, can be inconvenient, of course, and unpleasant for patients and, and for their family members, of course, at the end of life. And so this is corroborated by the fact that the vast majority of people who undergo made provisions in Canada end up dying in their home setting because <clears throat> they don't want to die in a healthcare setting. So obviously, this is a downside to undergoing um, post-made organ donation. Now, um, what we call made is on the on the transplant side is, is what we call a controlled uh, donation after cardiac death. So made provision occurs and it's followed by a five minute no touch period before the organs can be procured after cardiopulmonary cessation of function. Um, so in doing this, this upholds the dead donor rule. <clears throat> and the dead donor rule is a widely accepted ethical standard for those of you who don't know in transplant medicine and that's specifically for deceased organ donation. So it stipulates that organs should only ever be recovered from donors who have died and nothing should be done by an organ recovery program that would hasten the death. Now, this process does minimize the ischemic damage to organs uh, comparably to other DCD uh, transplants, for example. So there's li pretty little time between the injection of the lethal medication and cessation of cardiopulmonary activity. <clears throat> and so this is a positive thing for post-transplant outcomes for recipients of these organs, because minimizing ischemic damage means lower rates of delayed graft function and lower rates of associated complications. So the Netherlands um, does have an option for people to die at home, and they're really pioneers in the area. They're, they've been pioneers in a lot of things with respect to euthanasia, um, but I would say that this is one thing that I, I think is incredibly important. So they call it domestic organ donation after euthanasia. So what happens here is that an oral um, sedative is, is administered at home, and so the patient gets the experience of, of being at home and their last memories uh, with, uh, with them, with their family members, and their last experience being in their home environment. So um, they're uh, administered an oral sedative at home, they're intubated and transferred to a, their local hospital, they undergo the lethal injection in the hospital while intubated and sedated, and then they undergo organ procurement in the hospital. The patient's body may be returned home at four hours after the procedure if requested by the family for bereavement. <clears throat> so in this, the Netherlands really allows for the MAID process to begin at home, um, and this may be the way of the future as post-MAID organ donation gains more traction in Canada and other countries. 
but clearly it's very resource intensive. So obviously we'll take some time to develop the infrastructure around something like this. So there are of course some ethical issues and questions that come up with post made organ donation. <clears throat> Common ones that are asked include, can family members of a potential made donor veto organ donation following made? Now, requests for made um, may be kept confidential if this is desired by the patient. There's no requirement for a patient to disclose the fact that they're undergoing made to anybody in their life. Um, and so um, this wish should be upheld with, to respect patient autonomy. However, when we introduce organ donation into the discussion, um, a family may find out that organs were retrieved due to incisions post-mortem, and this has the potential to destabilize public trust in organ transplantation. So there could be suppositions that organs were procured without consent or that the procurement itself caused the patient's death. So patients really are encouraged to disclose their decision for post-made organ donation to their family members. And every effort should be made by the organ transplant organization to try to promote effective communication among family and patient. This is because um, organ procurement is not really entirely possible following made if the family doesn't know about it and if they're present for the provision. If the family is present with the individual and they have to be taken off to the OR after made uh, occurs, it should be clear why this is happening. There shouldn't be any surprises for the family in that time. And so patients retain their capacity to consent up until made provision in most countries. And so they also must be able to reaffirm their consent for organ donation as well. And so family veto is not practiced in any country that allows post made organ donation. So another um, question that comes up, are healthcare providers able to object to being involved in the procurement of organs following MAID? So MAID may conflict with personal or religious beliefs of healthcare providers. And so there are actually written accounts of physicians who have refused to take part in organ procurement or even subsequent organ transplantation from donors who have undergone MAID. Now, conscientious objection is ethically permissible if alternate arrangements have been made. So physician autonomy is a due consideration in healthcare ethics, so long as the duty to refer a patient is upheld. So given that made as a planned procedure, there should just be adequate time to find an alternate healthcare professional to take over. A, phys a physician's own objection to made or to post-made organ donation should not impede the ability of a patient to access these services. And a poll of Quebec healthcare professionals indicated support for conscientious objection, so long as all efforts were made to correct misunderstandings um, around organ donation and medical assistance in dying. So are, um, are recipients of organs from MAID donors entitled to know if their donor died from MAID? Now, interestingly, in Belgium and the Netherlands, patients must consent to receive MAID organs and this is done at the time of act activation to the transplant wait list. This is out of respect to potential recipients who may not be in support of euthanasia legislation within those countries. But honestly, I have significant issues with this on an ethical front. Um, <clears throat> Canada, in Canada, that it is not required to consent is not required to receive made organs. And um, when we discussed that previous survey from Canadian Blood Services, 25% of survey respondents actually were undecided if they would accept an organ uh, from a made donor. But what's important to note is that there's no real increased risk with accepting an organ from a made donor. And so the information that the um, organ came from a made donor is unnecessary to disclose, much like race or religion of a donor are unnecessary for recipients to know. It has no bearings on outcomes post-transplant for the recipient to know that an individual died by made. So withholding information like the cause of death from a potential recipient really relieves that person of the burden to consenting to receiving the organ. So, for example, we don't tell every tell somebody that you know they had uh, a young donor who died of polytrauma, uh, and that's where they got their organ from. I mean, that's not necessary for a recipient's outcomes, and it may actually impose psychological suffering from the very thought of it. <clears throat> and in my mind, the same goes for uh, the person who died of MAID. Um, so, allocation of these organs in Canada occur per, per our normal provincial algorithms. If there was data to show that maybe there was adverse outcomes following transplant of MAID donor organs, then maybe there would be more way to this argument of needing consent from recipients, but it's simply a controlled DCD, and it's actually minimizes ischemic damage relative to other DCD kidneys, and so there's, uh, sorry, other DCD organs. So there's no reason to believe that these transplants represent any sort of increased risk for recipients that would require them to uh, consent to receive them. So speaking of uh, outcomes post-made, um, you know, there's only one publication regarding the outcomes post-made of organ transplantation in Canada thus far. Um, 
this is data from Postmate organ donor outcomes from 2018 to 2020, and this was the first nine patients who were done in London, Ontario. <clears throat> As you can see, there was one patient with delayed graft function. The graft outcomes, however, were, were overall reasonable, and the remainder of patients had immediate graft function. There was one death in the patient uh, named recipient four, um, and this was reportedly due to post-operative reaction to ATG, um, but the patient was reported to have immediate graft uh, function um, of, the, of the kidney. So the table shows that people who receive post-made organ transplants have acceptable graft outcomes, at least from a kidney transplant point of view. Larger scale data will obviously be needed to, uh, as this evolves as, a, as, a, as an entity to further prove this point. Um, anecdotally, I can say in BC over the last two years that I've been working uh, in the program, I can say that post-made organ transplants have had excellent outcomes with minimal to no DGF. Um, so hopefully we see more data about, from this in the future and something that me and my colleagues can explore and look into further. So <clears throat> is this a viable solution to our organ shortage problem in Canada and in other countries practicing made? So this is one of the only publications that, that there is on the effect of post-made organ donation on the organ shortage problem. And it's from 2014, published in Transplantation on the Swiss Experience. Of note, Switzerland does not actually allow post-made organ donation still to this day. Um, but they found that if, if only 20% of post-euthanasia of, um, post organ, if only 20% of people undergoing euthanasia consented to organ donation in Switzerland, this would essentially double the number of organs available and a consent rate of 50% would achieve a surplus of organs once the waiting list was reduced. Now, granted, these numbers are now approximately eight years out of date, but this highlights the potential magnitude of effect that a wider acceptance of post-made organ donation could have on wait lists. <clears throat> now, we'll revisit this uh, schematic that I presented earlier. So what could this do for Canada? So as we already discussed, non-cancer cases made up about 35% of made last year. If we do the math, that's 3,462 non malignancy cases are made, the majority of which could likely be eligible for organ donation. So that's potentially over 6,900 kidneys that could be available for potential transplantation across the country. So yeah, I do argue that this could be a viable, at least a partial solution to our organ shortage problem across the country, and hopefully would reduce death on our transplant wait list. So <clears throat> there have been proposed alternatives to post-made organ donation and various ethicists and physicians have proposed these alternatives mostly for discussion. But um, the first one is the most, um, I would say, uh, ethically and legally permissible and the one that has, has actually come up before. So living donation, living organ donation prior to made. So arguments have been made by patients and by ethicists that pre-mortem organ donation for made recipients should be permitted to allow them the psychological benefit of altruism. So we allow living, you know, living kidney donation. And so why should a made, re made recipient be any different? And so this hit the press in a case of an ALS patient in Wisconsin who wanted to donate a kidney prior to his death with knowledge that this would have better graft outcomes for a recipient. And he himself wanted to derive the psychological benefit of having known he's done an altruistic act before his death. So this was his autonomous wish that he wanted to donate prior to death. <clears throat> and so there were plans made for something called imminent death donation. Uh, with Dr. Joshua Mesrich, whose book is um, highlighted on the right there, and that's where the story is published. So for imminent death donation, the patient would receive general anesthetic, have one kidney removed, and return to the ICU for extubation. And if the patient were to die if, um, following extubation due to respiratory muscle weakness, it would have been due to his ALS, not necessarily from the organ, uh, organ procurement. So this was actually supported by the Hospital Ethics Committee, and it worked all its way all the way up to legal, um, but unfortunately was ultimately declined by hospital legal as, there was a, as they were concerned about the risk that any involved staff could be charged with murder or acceleration of the patient's death. So as this illustrates, it would actually be hard pressed to find an organ procurement organization that would allow pre-made organ donation, at least routinely. Um, so it's legally and ethically permissible, but any adverse outcome even a patient in a patient's plan for MAID could cause uh, pretty intense regulatory and media scrutiny. So. Um, not really going to be embarked upon anytime soon, in my opinion. Um, extended living donation prior to MAID um, is another um, idea that's come up in which essential organs are procured, but death is caused actually by cessation of life-sustaining treatments after procurement, rather than from loss of vital organ function. So this has been debated as being in violation of the dead donor rule, which requires that vital organs only be procured from a dead individual. Proponents argue that the donor doesn't die from the procurement, but rather the cessation of life support measures. 
truly, I just see this as a case of semantics. I don't, less ethically and legally, I think it's entirely murky and that should not be practiced and is impermissible at this time. And then finally, the most controversial topic in this realm is made by organ donation, wherein the patient dies through procurement of essential organs and thus combines made and organ donation into a single action. Now, this is clearly a, a violation of <clears throat> the dead donor rule, though it's you know, it's been questioned if the dead donor rule should even apply at all in cases of made, um, and the, if the priority should really be placed on a patient's autonomous decision making, if, even if that means death by donation. So at this time, the dead donor rule is upheld in all situations, and I think it should remain so to prevent dissolution of any sort of public trust in transplant medicine. And so made by organ donation is, out of all of these, the most legally and ethically impermissible. <clears throat> So what about directed organ donation? <clears throat> we, <clears throat> we allow directed living organ donation um, and it's permitted by uh, transplant programs uh, across the country. Directed deceased organ donation can be also considered on a case-by-case -case basis. And there have been several cases of directed deceased donation in Canada. Practices and policies do differ among Canadian provinces for patient initiated requests of directed organ donation. In Saskatchewan, however, <clears throat> they've outright banned directed deceased donation altogether in their provincial policy statement. And I've not heard whether or not this would be amended and I'm not heard of, I've not heard if they're actually practicing this on a case-by-case -case basis, but they're the only province that has a, um, a formal statement that is, uh, is not allowed. In Ontario, Ontario Health has specified that a directed deceased donation can happen if the intended recipient is a family member or an individual with a long-standing emotional relationship. There also can't be a person on the list who's in more urgent clinical need for the directed donation to proceed. In the United States, directed donation is authorized under the Uniform Anatomical Gift Act and the American Society of Transplantation uh, also supports this so long as there's no evidence of coercion. <clears throat> of note, it's uh, not permitted in Belgium or the Netherlands under Eurotransplant, though both of these countries are in the process of drafting policies to allow directed uh, deceased donation under certain circumstances. So what are the concerns uh, about directed deceased donation and why is there so much turmoil amongst physicians and ethicists with this idea? <clears throat> the concern primarily that's quoted most, most commonly is the potential for external pressure for undue influence and for coercion in a vulnerable patient. So vulnerability as a concept is quite a paternalistic medical term that supposes that an individual who's vulnerable can't actually exercise autonomy, which is untrue. So almost all patients undergoing MADE are vulnerable in some respect. I will agree to that, but, um, but this does not remove their autonomy. So how do we judge who's being coerced? Is it even possible to judge that? I argue that unless coercion is overt and disposed to the organ transplant organization, it can be quite difficult to ascertain. There's also a significant dogma <clears throat> in healthcare that autonomous decision-making should be made in isolation. But relation, relational autonomy kind of specifies that people make decisions based on their relationships and, and the environment in which they're socially rooted and acknowledge that decision making is often a result of their social interactions and their context. So it's, it's natural that there be some weight in a patient's decision making to pursue made by other factors. And if one such factor might be organ donation to a specific individual, there's not much that we can really do about that, to be honest, as a healthcare community. And just by blanket preventing um, direct organ donation following made, this isn't upholding the autonomy of a, of a uh, potential donor. There's concerns that patients may choose to die sooner because their concerns of well-being of others may potentially supersede their own in that circumstance. There's concern that a person who may feel compelled to go through with made if there's someone that they know awaiting an organ after their death. There's concern regarding public trust in organ transplantation and fair distribution of, of a scarce resource as this could be seen as jumping the queue, for example, and people who are further down on the list and then get a directed donation. And then <clears throat> there's always, it's always brought up whenever these ideas come up in transplants um, that stray from the norm that a potential for a slippery slope. Um, and there's concerns around uh, financial gain from donation and ultimately support of organ trade. However, there's no higher risk with directed organ donation following made than there is with directed living organ donation, which occurs routinely. So I don't see why this is any different. If there are proper checks and safeguards in place to prevent this, incentivization should become an issue with directed organ donation. So these are just some of the editorial titles that have been published in the CMAJ, the Canadian Journal of Anesthesiology, and the Journal of Medical Ethics that are highlighting that highlight some of the significant distress among healthcare providers when considering directed organ donation after made. Most of these publications really focus on the risks of coercion and external pressure on patients. 
Interestingly, the 2019 guidelines that were published in the CMAJ that we already mentioned that were a collaboration between Canadian Blood Services, EST, and other organizations did actually, actually did not recommend directed disease donation um, following medical assistance in dying. The primary concern was noted to be an entanglement of, the, of made and organ donation with the risk of coercion. Um, of note, these guidelines are in the process of being revised as we speak, and so an updated publication is expected within the coming year. Um, so hopefully <clears throat> there'll be more uh, support for directed organ donation following made. <clears throat> So these are um, some direct quotes from a qualitative study done in 2021, looking at the attitudes of Quebec healthcare providers with respect to post-made organ donation. And I think these highlight the split that we see in the medical community between support and lack of support for directed donation following need. And most of it is truly a gut reaction. And when a lot of these people were challenged on their concepts, they often um, change their viewpoint. So first, um, uh, editorial was that a person said organs are allocated by priority based on waiting lists. I don't. I think it isn't fair for other patients who are higher on the on the waiting list. Why would they get? Why wouldn't they get access when it's their turn? And this is uh, speaking to the queue jumping that we mentioned earlier. My reflex is to say no. I don't support it. But when you think of the living donor context, you don't have many arguments left to say no. It would be very sad if someone you knew or someone you. It, it would be very sad if someone you knew or someone you wanted to benefit could not benefit from your own donation. At that point, it's also just for justice for the person, person who wants to donate. Do you need a yes, no answer? Because I'm kind of ambivalent. And this position was opposed to the idea initially. And when challenged by the fact that living donations are directed, uh, changed his mind. And then finally, I think it's, it's their condition for donating. We will just get more organs that way. I can't see any reason for refusing. We have to take all opportunities. <clears throat> And so to highlight the complexities of this decision and this discussion, BC Transplant has generated a handout to give, to give to patients and families who are considering directed donation. This is for any directed disease donation, not specifically following made. So these questions specifically revolve around how a relationship might change with the recipient following a directed donation. How would they feel more about more or less contact with the recipient after? Um, how are they going to manage personal boundaries after the transplant, specifically with donor family and recipients? How would they feel if a recipient was engaging in activities post-transplant that they didn't agree with? Or how would, they find, how would they feel if they found out that an organ was failing or not working for various reasons? There's a similar handout with questions that's given to a recipient of a directed donation. And I think these handouts are truly an excellent resource and useful for prompting more thought around the decision, uh, as these are all important considerations for potential donors, for their families, and for the recipients. So what are the pros of permitting directed deceased organ donation? So ultimately, I think the, the biggest pro here is respecting the autonomous wish of a dying patient. MADE is the ultimate example of respecting a patient's autonomy. So why should directed organ donation following MADE be any different if it's free from coercion and from external pressure? Um, improving access to transplantation for all uh, recipients on the wait list. So the more people that get transplanted, the shorter the wait times for transplantation. Directed organ donation to a relative may be a better immunologic match, and that has implications for rejection risk for their future. Um, the, the consistency with directed living kidney donor policies, I think, is important to highlight because it supports transparency and clarity with the public. And then finally, forbidding it altogether may push patients to ask for living organ donation pre-made, which, as we've talked about, um, is a practice that you probably won't get very many organ procurement organizations to at least routinely endorse. So in my mind, directed organ donation following made is ethically and legally permissible. All of the concerns around coercion, vulnerability, external pressure, et cetera, can be mitigated by just establishing appropriate communication and safeguard, safeguards between the transplant and the made teams. So I formulated some recommendations um, for organ procurement organization policy development with respect to directed organ donation following made. <clears throat> and I'll go through them now. So recommendation one, is that all healthcare professionals working with the organ procurement organization should be educated on made eligibility and the consent process, end of life care options that are available for patients in that geographic region, organ donation eligibility and consent process, and required donor referral legislation if it's appropriate within that province. Um, all healthcare professionals working with the organ procurement organizations should be able to practice conscientious objection and withdraw involvement in post-made directed organ donation, so long as there is sufficient time and resources to recruit substitute healthcare professionals. 
All requests for directed donation following MAID should be voluntarily communicated by the patient after the decision to undergo MAID has been made without any suggestion from an organ procurement organization. So some, what's important here is that, um, as I mentioned before, is that some organ procurement organizations will stipulate that directed donation can only happen to a family member or a close friend, um, basically somebody who the, per the donor has had a long-standing emotional relationship with. I don't personally subscribe to this as relationships can be quite difficult to tease out, so I purposely not commented on whom these donations can be directed to, as again, I don't think this upholds the autonomy principle we're basing made and post-made donation on. Obviously, we want to make sure that there's no coercion or any sort of other factors contributing to their decision making, but I don't think we can stipulate exactly who these directed donations can go to. And then finally, I, I haven't included a clause for unconditional consent. In theory, it makes sense that somebody, if they want to donate their organs to a specific person, they should want to donate their organs to anybody on the wait list, uh, even if their directed donation doesn't pan out. But practically speaking, a person may decide to withdraw their consent to donate at any time. So enforcing unconditional consent is not ethically permissible. It can violate autonomy. And people may wish to die at home. And so thus, when they are unable to directly donate their organs to an intended recipient, then they can just if that doesn't work out, then they can have the home death that they wanted. And so there's no way that we can kind of enforce this um, idea of unconditional consent. All requests for directed donation post made can be revoked at any time up until the time of made provision. All requests for directed donation post made will be kept confidential and donor privacy will be maintained as much as possible. Um, but as mentioned, donors should be encouraged to inform their intended recipient of their intent to donate their organs directly to this person once their eligibility is confirmed because this promotes transparency in the process. Regardless, recipients won't be informed of the source of the donated organ unless it's specifically consented to by the made donor. Requests for directed donation post made cannot be overruled by family regardless of the current capacity of the individual undergoing made. Organ procurement organizations should make all reasonable efforts to ensure that there's no undue influence or coercion uh, contributing to a patient request for directed donation. So if there's any evidence of monetary exchange or any sort of similar valuable consideration, or if there's any perceived or observed coercion involved, the directed donation should not proceed. All potential donors undergoing MAID and requesting directed donation following MAID must know that the request for directed donation may not be fulfilled due to recipient eligibility, fiscal compatibility, or log logistical considerations, for example. If there are high status, medically urgent, or highly sensitized patients identified as potential recipients of a donor's organ, a discussion should be had with the donor regarding organ allocation. Again, I don't think it can be enforced that a patient is required to donate their organs to other individuals if they're uh, looking for a directed organ donation. And this is because, again, we're trying to uphold respecting their autonomy as much as possible in this process. Some organ procurement organizations have taken a very firm stance and that, you know, these patients, these high status patients are uh, supersede all directed donor requests. And I agree with this intuitively from a medical perspective and from a transplant physician perspective, I entirely agree. And that's important for enhancing health equity for all waitlisted recipients. But from an ethical standpoint, in terms of this entire process, that we, we can't overrule the autonomy of an individual to directly donate an organ to whomever they want. So if they want to, if they hear about this, but they still want to directly donate to an individual, um, I don't think that we can overrule that and require that they donate to somebody else. Um, monitoring and review of directed organ donation practices following MAID should be undertaken by the organ procurement organization and the governing, governing bodies. And then finally, transparency regarding direct, directed organ donation post made policies should be prioritized through publication of guidance documents on public platforms. And support, including legal counsel, should be available for donors, donor families, recipients of directed organ donation, and healthcare professionals dealing with post made organ donation. So in summary, <clears throat> post-made organ donation is permitted in Canada. Post-made uh, directed organ donation is permitted on a case-by-case -case basis in most jurisdictions in Canada. Post-made directed organ donation is ethically permissible, so long as it is free from coercion as it respects donor autonomy. And a wider acceptance of post-made organ donation, both directed and non-directed, will increase the supply of available organs for transplants and hopefully reduce our waiting times and death on the wait list. An institution of post-made directed organ donation guidelines and policies will be important to efficiently and effectively handle these requests in the future. So I hope that you found this talk as engaging and as lightning as I did my research on the topic. Um, it's natural for discussions of MAID to generate some moral and ethical dilemmas. And so I welcome a chance to discuss this further with anybody who's interested, either 
in the Q&A period now or in other venues. And I thank you for your attention and welcome any questions now. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Justin. That was a comprehensive overview of both made considerations with donation and then directed donation. We do have a couple of questions, so I'm going to go through those first. That, uh, If you have a question, please uh, feel free to uh, send it into the chat. The first question is from Oliver Gunther. Um, and the question is, is, would it be useful to provide information to a made patient on how, quote unquote, useful their organ donation may be for the public good? i.e. giving them a sense of the potential benefit for patients on wait list. And then there's some specifics about epilet matching and so forth. But really the question is, is, is how do you feel about um, uh, incorporating that information routinely to a made patient in terms of the potential societal benefits of their gift? Yeah, I think it's, uh, I mean, again, supporting transparency in the process and um, people understanding exactly how important their gift is to, to the organ transplant community is important. I think um, if patients want to directly donate an organ to an individual, but they match to, as mentioned, a highly sensitized person or somebody else, and they may have a significant benefit in that way, it's, it's worth a, definitely worth a discussion. I think if we have the data to back up, you know, how many people could you benefit with this donation? How would this work? How, you know, would your kidney go to a person who's highly sensitized on the list? I think that's important to discuss with a patient, but it would never supersede their autonomous wish to donate to whomever they wanted. So in short, yes, uh, important to be transparent, um, but important to um, be transparent without any sort of external pressure or forcing the patient to do something they don't want to do. That's a great answer, Justin. And just Oliver, just I expand on that. As Justin mentioned, uh, these are controlled DCD cases. So heart donation right now uh, it, although DCD heart ex vivo has been practiced and there's uh, movement with regards to normal thermic regional perfusion, that's not routine right now for DCD, controlled DCD donors in British Columbia. So heart donation is something that, you know, the potential donor would be advised would not normally take place. Other organs could be uh, donated. We're focusing on kidneys here, but other organs could be donated. The next question, Justin, is for Claire Harris. How do you compare the ethical considerations of non-directed anonymous living donors versus made? Uh, I'll just expand on this because I'm not entirely sure what Dr. Harris is asking. There are often concerns about the mental health of anonymous living donors and their intentions. Do you see similar concerns with donation after made once mental illness is included in the eligibility for made? So she's really focusing on the expanded indications for made um, uh, specifically regard to mental illness? Yes, it's a great question, uh, Claire. Um, so I think that's going to be something, as mentioned, uh, including mental illness in the MAID legislation is going to be extremely contentious. Um, I can already tell because the, gu the guidelines as to how to include it um, have been very wishy-washy. So again, if you read that um, report that was published earlier this year, it's difficult to tease out exactly who's going to be eligible for this. Um, I, I certainly it brings up concerns around people's ability to the, the capacity to consent for organ donation in the context of mental illness. And certainly, you know, there will have to be appropriate procedural safeguards in that respect to make sure that they have the capacity to consent to that decision. My, my thought process is that if they have the capacity to consent to medical assistance in dying, and if we have, um, and if we have decided on that as a medical community that they fulfill that criterion, I don't think that there's any reason why we wouldn't believe that that person would be able to consent to organ donation as well. But once it comes into legislation, we're obviously going to have to have more discussions around this because that is another hot button topic <laughs> to come. But excellent yeah. question. Yeah, it's definitely a moving point for sure, Dr. Harris. Um, Justin, I, I've been involved in a couple of directed donations and my standard approach with BC Transplant has always been to say that the decision to donate should be independent of the expectation that it could be an organ could be provided to the specific individual you'd like to see get that organ, and you highlighted this as point number eight in your in in one of your uh, key recommendation statements. I think that's really important because there may be uh, blood group uh, incompatibilities or medical insuitability of people 
um, who uh, somebody may, wishes to direct an organ to. And I guess the issue then, uh, Justin, is, is, is managing that expectation in this context. Uh, any thoughts about that? Uh, I, I, I know I'm bringing up something, but procedurally, to me, I think that the directed donation in the MAID should follow uh, what happens in directed donation in, in uh, other deceased donors. And that's really a fundamental principle that although the transplant team uh, will try to uh, uh, respect your wishes, they need to understand that that may not be possible. So thoughts about that in this context? Yeah, I think the, I, that was the idea of unconditional consent that I was mentioning in terms of, um, you know, some, some people, some pro organ procurement organizations will um, require that of people that they have to have consent for organ donation in general. And then if they want to donate to a specific individual, then we'll try to facilitate that happening. I think that's very reasonable in principle um, that somebody, you know, they have to know that their organ donation may not pan out for one reason or another to that directed individual. But I don't think we can enforce um, a kind of blanket um, unconditional consent on patients because if they find out, like, for example, that they can't donate to their brother or whomever else in their family, they may wish to not go through with organ donation at all, which is fine because then that means they don't have to die in a hospital. And so there's no way to practically enforce um, unconditional consent. I think it's important at the beginning to get an idea of what their motivations are and to understand that they're just trying to be altruistic, they want to help, and that there's no sort of other coercion or other factors influencing their decision. But I don't think practically we can actually enforce that. Um, hopefully that answers your question, but I, I think it's it's important for us to bring it up to patients and, and understand their reasoning. But I don't think if they don't want to go ahead with just general donation, if they only want to go ahead with directed, then of course that's their decision. Yeah, and, and, and I guess that there could be some logistical complications with that, as you've alluded to, we try to minimize blood draws and, and, and so forth. And so sometimes um, it, it, there may be feasibility considerations. I know we're short on time. Um, as Chuck yeah. said, you're, um, please reach out to him for additional um, uh, engagement on this complex topic. I think this topic is really important because obviously societal trust is inherent to everything we do in organ donation and transplantation. Discussing these uh, complex issues candidly in our community um, and for you all to be aware of these issues because you may be approached by you know, anybody in our community about these is I think very, very important. So Justin, thank you very much for uh, taking us through this uh, uh, discourse. Uh, congratulations on your master's degree. And for all those out there that are interested in, in transplantation and organ donation, it's more than uh, just the immunology and the surgical, uh, the societal uh, and ethical uh, uh, considerations are uh, vastly interesting. And so I hope you'll reach out to Justin uh, if uh, this has piqued your interest. Thanks very much. And thank you, Adira, for the opportunity to for, to, uh, for transplant to present here. Great, thank you. And there's a question from Morgan that maybe Justin can answer offline, but uh, has to do sure, with yeah. the logistics of moving people around, which I think is really important in a province like this. But thank you, uh, John and Justin, and uh, for all the work that you do uh, and the thoughtfulness with which you presented that, Justin. It was a, it's a big topic. It's a lot of things to think about, but uh, very important that... Uh, as a province, we appreciate, understand, and uh, help to support this. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Adira. Thanks, John. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye -bye.